Stephen. It was very, very nice to be back here. I was last here um, 18 months ago. It was very nice to be a part of this group. Um, so I'm uh, from Twins UK, which is based at King's College London. Um, and I think I'll just start by saying, um, because I've raised it before over the last 48 hours, that I don't have any preconceptions about um, the way in which this might be useful, um, because I think there are many, many ways in which you guys knowing about this resource could be useful. So not just the debate about whether fatigue in the general population has any relevance at all to, to CFSME, um, but also to recognise that these folk have been very, very uh, studied over the last 28 years it is now, um, and if nothing else, they would provide useful controls to studies like metabolomics, proteomics. They are very widely phenotyped and omityped. And so uh, I think there are many different study designs that can come out of twins, uh, and therefore um, it's, it's of interest to know about them. But Twins UK was, was set up by a rheumatologist, Tim Spector, and so when it was founded to study osteoporosis and osteoarthritis, it had naturally a rheumatological bent to it. It now covers all imaginable traits, such as would you vote for Tony Blair? We've asked everything of these poor twins, um, and they are phenomenally generous with their time and with their tissues. And we are currently, just to, to, as an aside, uh, very interested in the microbiome. So we do run uh, microbiome studies on the twins. We have 4,000 stool samples. We're proud to believe we're one of the largest collections of stools in the country. Uh, we run Map My Gut. We run British Gut. Um, and um, I've just received funding from Versus Arthritis to do a spine study of the microbiome. So we have a lot of microbiome experience, and we're beginning, um, as, as others have mentioned, to recognize that tissues that we thought previously were sterile are actually um, incubating bugs whose um, DNA one can detect. So we have a long-standing interest in chronic pain, in joint pain, in back pain, in intervertebral disc degeneration, and also um, pelvic pain, irritable bowel syndrome, and migraine. And we've collected these data longitudinally over the, the last three decades. Chronic fatigue in the general population is prevalent and is associated with changes at menopause, with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and lots of other conditions that we've heard mentioned so far. We see it very much as part of the chronic pain syndromes uh, and associated with anxiety and depression. And teasing these relationships apart and trying to understand cause and consequence can be very challenging. Unpicking the symptom patterns is very tricky and um, there are special approaches that you can use to avoid bear traps. So if you take any two traits, you can imagine perhaps anxiety and pelvic pain or depression and migraine, call them X and Y, the really, trying to understand the relationship between those two traits may be uh, difficult for a number of reasons. So X may cause Y, Y may cause X, or they may be related to one, an one another by the presence of a confounder or a shared risk factor. And one of the things that I think is troubling in conditions such as CFSME is that case control studies may be prone to bias uh, if they recruited differently. And we've heard talk of how using MS controls is a really neat way to try and uh, get around some of these difficulties. And you also need very well-funded, expensive, longitudinal studies in order to work out the temporal sequence of what comes first. Twins, however, are uh, an opportunity to try and disentangle this because uh, you can tease apart the genetic and environmental risk factors. So just to remind you, twins are either identical or non-identical according to how they developed in utero. So the identicals form from a single egg fertilized by a single sperm, which divides early on in its development. While these guys are uh, genetically as similar as siblings, they share on average 50% of their genetic material and are derived from two sperm and two eggs. But these have also advantages over siblings because they are very much in the same environment uh, from conception and are the same age. So uh, assuming that they share the same uh, shared environment, common environment C, 
Uh, because we know the relationship between the twins, uh, the additive genetic effect A, uh, which are ma uh, completely matched in monozygotic or identical twins, and are 50% in the dizygotics, we can work out the relationships for the uh, additive genetic, the unique environment to the twin and the shared environment. And based on that, you can then devise a number of interesting study designs where you can select twins on the basis of whether they have a condition of interest or not. So for example, I'm running studies at present looking at the rheumatoid microbiome in pairs of twins, one of whom has developed rheumatoid, the other one hasn't. And this matches for lots and lots of interesting things, not just the genetics. You're matching for their age, for their sex, because these are all same-sex twins. Um, and so you can do studies with very much more smaller samples than in the general population. So that's just to give you a flavor of the tools that we have available to us. And of course, because we have 13,000 twins on our books, we can regard them as a population sample and ignore the twinness, if you like. You have to adjust for it in the analysis. But we can do studies that ju just mean this is a large sample of people. Um, what, what can we work out from that? So I wanted to mention some work that I found particularly interesting when I started thinking about for chronic fatigue, uh, which was performed in the Swedish Twin Register. And it's quite an old paper, or, or series of papers in the, in the early uh, part of the millennium, um, in which, in the first one, they performed a really neat nested, nested case control uh, based on their longitudinal cohort of twins. And in this study, they took all the twins, because the Sweden, Swedish and Scandinavian twin registers are different from ours, they're birth cohorts, they select them from birth, uh, and they recruited all twins that were born in this window, and uh, or the, these were the ones that were taken from the register because they recruit all of their twins into the register at birth. And they uh, assessed their self-reported stress levels and personality scales by a questionnaire administered in 1972. So they subsequently held a telephone study in 1998 to assess various symptoms and fatigue type questions. So the beauty of this is that you have a population sample from which you've taken a nested case control set uh, that have personality and stress uh, measured before you determine the disease onset. So it's a very powerful study design. And what it shows, I'll show you the data in a second, it showed that high stress and emotional stability um, have quite significant uh, odds ratios for, for leading to chronic fatigue. But in, in the generalized uh, 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 study, but when they actually looked by co-twin pairs, um, the emotional instability, the personality trait dropped out, but the stress risk factor went up uh, from 1.6 to 5.8, suggesting there's a really strong effect of uh, life factors um, that are outside uh, the twins' control. And this just shows those data. Um, it's quite complicated, but if you read these dots from left to right, these are the general estimating equations um, for each of these uh, traits. Uh, and they're adjusted for twin relatedness, but that's like looking at them as a population sample. The middle dot is um, adjusting for the, uh, includes both the MZ and the DZ twins, and these are just the MZs. So these are the effect of, of removing all genetic influence altogether. And you can see this enormous shift in the uh, stress odds ratio as a risk factor for the CSF-like illness here. So um, another study that they um, performed asked about um, uh, uh, different features. This was trying to understand where uh, chronic fatigue fits in the clustering of symptoms that um, we commonly see in rheumatology, actually. So chronic widespread pain, uh, myalgia, uh, sore throat, uh, foggy thinking, um, and uh, tried to understand the patterns of these conditions uh, that people uh, seem to have. It also, importantly, uh, asked about interference in life. Have you felt abnormally tired in the last six months? Yes. If yes, how much has it interfered in both your social life, your ability to go to work, and the important um, post-exertional malaise question. 
And then they did a, 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 a latent components analysis to investigate the heterogeneity of the groups. Um, and this is an enormous sample size of over 31,000 people. So these results are likely to be robust. Um, there's a prevalence of 21% of people um, in this age group uh, reported abnormal tiredness. And um, the results are shown by number of symptoms um, against the uh, score for uh, fatigue. And you'll see that the symptoms just sort of really linearly rise. So there's no step point in any of these symptoms that suggest if you've got four or more, you've got a different um, type of condition going on um, to, to if you have th three or less. And interestingly, this is, this is a complicated slide, but the point to note here is that they could then separate these, this very enormous sample into clusters um, of like uh, clusters of uh, conditions. Uh, in particular, they called uh, the class one a CFS-like illness. It had a, uh, a probability of a prevalence of 14%, and uh, in it there was a, a great deal of symptomatology and also a relationship with uh, depression and chronic widespread pain. This residual was sort of um, the remainder, uh, an unusual class, uh, rather more men. Uh, it, it had a third of the people in it and was very related to, I think it was sleep, I can't remember. This class three uh, is, is more like uh, the rheumatic condition fibromyalgia. Class four uh, was very influenced by uh, depression, and this looked like an acute febrile physical illness. This looked like a flu-like state. So there's the thing. So this is a very large population-based study with clear evidence for chronic fatigue syndrome. I think if anybody's doubting the presence of it, you can see it clearly in the general population. It's separate from depression. It's separate from fibromyalgia. As mentioned, the ancillary symptoms did not clearly delineate number, so uh, there was limited support for the CDC94 criteria. They also performed heritability studies because they were trying to see whether there's an obviously stronger heritability associated with one of those clusters, and they didn't find that. So just to say a little bit about our work then, um, uh, looking at metabolomics in fatigue, uh, as we've already heard, uh, we have the genome at the bottom, uh, which is underpinning all the, the proteins that are encoded, uh, and then the metabolites are considered one of the uh, measurable uh, biomarkers that are closest uh, uh, to the trait of interest, furthest away from the genomics, much more closely related to the <coughs> traits of interest. And there's some uh, precedent here in the literature in rheumatoid arthritis, increasing fatigue is associated with a metabolic pattern characterized by downregulation of metabolites. Uh, there's a correlation in chronic fatigue syndrome with beta alanine and symptom expression. And there are also some animal studies showing disruption of the urea cycle. Um, relating to uh, amino acids, uh, which I think is relevant to some of the other work that's been shown. So in our study, we were interested in working out whether we could detect a difference um, in fatigue uh, metabolites on the background of chronic widespread pain. So we were interested in seeing whether there was a difference uh, between uh, the two biomarker panels, if you like for those two traits. And we've asked about fatigue repeatedly over the years, since 2000, so we have some longitudinal data. We were trying to get at uh, not normal levels of tiredness, but at, at um, bothersome, really bothersome fatigue uh, that influences people's lives. And this is a rough schema of what we did. So from the database, we have uh, 7,000 or so who've answered fatigue questionnaires, uh, of which roughly 2,000 with chronic widespread pain. And we looked for the overlap uh, with those that have uh, metabolomic markers measured in plasma. Uh, there was standard data processing here. 
we excluded, uh, for this study, we excluded men so that we could try and uh, keep the group as homogeneous as possible and those with known inflammatory disease causing fatigue like rheumatoid lupus and inflammatory bowel disease. So we used um, uh, linear mixed models adjusting for batch and for zygosity and obviously corrected for multiple testing and we tried to design um, uh, combinations of metabolites to see whether we could uh, make a predictive uh, biomarker panel. So um, the uh, really single nominally significant result was for this uh, uh, icosapentenoate, um, which we found associated with fatigue uh, and uh, showed something of a dose response. Uh, it falls uh, with increasing, sorry, increasing botherness of the condition. So the most uh, uh, affected by fatigue uh, had the lowest levels, and this was uh, nominally significant at p times 10 to the minus 5. There were others that were nominally significant. Uh, and what is EPO? Well, it's an omega-3 fatty acid. It's an important polyunsaturated fatty acid found in fish oil. Uh, it's an important precursor for inflammatory mediators, which might be telling us something about mechanisms in fatigue. Um, and we know that people that have a diet rich in EPA have um, reduced inflammatory cytokines, CRP, IL-6, TNF-alpha, um, possibly due to its anti-inflammatory effects. Predicting uh, CWP, chronic widespread pain, fatigue in CWP, I should say, um, we used all possible combinations of metabolites uh, and then found that 15 uh, gave us this uh, rock curve of, uh, with an area under the curve of around 75%. So, you know, beginning to be able to tease out those folk with fatigue on the background of already having chronic widespread pain. So these aren't against healthy controls, it's on the background of chronic widespread pain. So, um, in summary, I think twins are, are very useful uh, to study in uh, chronic fatigue. The Swedish twin study uh, was a very large uh, study and shows there are common clusters of symptoms that can be reasonably delineated into uh, disease nomenclature. Uh, we saw that there's an influence of exogenous stressors uh, and that there are genetic factors linked with uh, personality which might be worth exploring uh, because we know uh, there are uh, um, drugs that could potentially um, act centrally that might be of benefit. In Twins UK we found that fatigue associated with CWP is associated with reduced EPA um, consistent with other uh, work on inflammatory uh, cytokines and diet and of course the next step would be to look more closely uh, at the microbiome, we have dietary information um, on all these people and of course that's the, that's the rather the missing confounder in studying metabolomics. Um, but we've shown that circulating metabolites can provide uh, biomarkers for fatigue. All these data are sitting there, uh, they are uh, available to researchers. If anybody wants to apply for them, please drop me a line. I'll help you with the application form. There's a single one-off fee, but they are readily available. So what I would propose would be that uh, people might uh, very reasonably uh, apply for these data, do their studies, and then go forward and test whether the, the, the positive findings in chronic fatigue in the general population are relevant in patients with CFSME. Thank you very much.